Well, welcome everybody. This is um, our fourth edition of Color Talks, a series of artist conversations with the artists of Colorfield. My name is Maria Gastambide and I am director and chief curator of public art of the University of Houston system, which has one of the oldest and most significant university public art collections in the United States. I'm delighted that you are joining us today for this um, installment of our monthly series of conversations where we connect virtually with the artists of Colorfield. For us, this is a momentous exhibition. It's our first curated exhibition of outdoor sculptures and it is on view at the campus of the University of Houston through May, 2021. Colorfield features 13 large scale works by seven contemporary artists whose variety of different approaches address issues related to color. Today, the Amherst-based artist Sarah Brayman, known for her large scale sculptures that serve as monuments to everyday life, joins us in conversation with Dr. Natalie Heron, a, a scholar of modern and contemporary art and assistant professor at the University of, um, of Houston. Before diving in, let us take care of some housekeeping issues. We've planned a 40 to 45 minute conversation followed by a Q&A session at the end. Please submit your questions at any time through the Q&A chat box. And Natalie and Sarah will try to get through as many as, as them as they can. And we've also set aside some time upon the conclusion of the session for a quick survey. So without further ado, join me in welcoming our, our guest tonight. Thank you so much, Maria. It is an honor and pleasure to have a chance to be in conversation with Sarah and as well to have the chance to be live and work near to one of her sculptures. Her work here um, is included in the Colorfield exhibition. It's situated on the U of H campus, for those of you familiar with the campus between the main MD Anderson Research Library and Colin Hall. And um, it's in a, it's one of the most centrally located works in the exhibition. So, and, and also just a reason to visit campus, even if you're not taking classes in person, the Colorfield exhibition is a wonderful opportunity to just come to campus, get a breath of fresh air and really get up close and personal with um, works by a number of major contemporary artists who are working in large scale sculpture, thinking about color, thinking about how their work interacts with public space. And I um, really wanted to be in conversation with Sarah because there are a number of threads in her practice that I find really intellectually compelling and also visually and formally and materially compelling. And, and so I'm really excited to have the opportunity to talk about how her work at UH came to be and also some of the influences behind it and um, sort of what led up to it. Um, but first I wanted, Sarah, if you would, to tell us a little bit about, you know, where you are, where is your studio, um, and what are your current working condition, conditions under the pandemic? Hi, thank you so much, Natalie, and thanks everyone for having me. Um, this is, this is um, an honor to be here and be part of this amazing show. And yeah, it's, it's fun to be able to speak with you and get to meet you. Um, I am currently, um, I live in Amherst, Massachusetts and under normal circumstances, I commute in and out of New York City where I work. I'm a partner in a contemporary art gallery called Canada, which has been running for 20 years. Um, and so we generally are in and out of the city every week. It's about a three hour drive and since the lockdown has just been a lockdown and then loosened lockdown, it's been a little less, but we're still slowly in and out. Um, uh, yeah, trying to manage the gallery, but like everybody else, just doing a lot more from home. And in Amherst here, I, I work in a studio in the next town in Hadley. It's a, an old auto body shop that I rent from um, a retired, um, mechanic. And that's the, what you're looking at now. This was, I think this was 
in the last year, anyway, sometime. Um, it's my son, my youngest son, who sometimes comes with me, Sonny. And um, yeah, I have a great space there. And um, I don't know, it's, it's a real refuge for the spirit there. <laughs> We're working, family come together, work gets made. It almost looks like there's a, a bed sort of tucked in the back corner. Yeah, there's a bunk bed from an old sculpture that sometimes gets used for napping now. And um, I'm in the process of building, we're building a studio in the on the property, which I think will um, be, be amazing. I, ha I actually, my time in the studio has slowed down for sure since March, um, just in terms of homeschooling and working from home and sort of the magnetic pull of family and home or feels a lot stronger um, in COVID than it, than it normally does. So getting over, even though this is only like 15 minute drive away, um, yeah, I have not had as much focus in the studio as I normally would. Um, although I've been working on plans for larger scale sculpture, which um, I can do a lot of that from home because it's a lot of drawing and working on the computer and Photoshop and stuff like that. So aside from your kids, do you normally work with studio assistants? Um, I, I, um, I've had very loosely, I've had a couple basically friends of my my older kids who are in their 20s. Um, I've hired friends of theirs to come and help me um, over the years, but and and sometimes in like you know once or twice a week for a few hours. Um, but that that's about it. And my husband helps me a lot when I need help. Um, and the kids, when they were living at home, the older kids, they would help me if I, you know, if I needed to move something really big or just kind of needed like hands-on in the moment. Looking at these images, which are just such a compelling, you know, vibrant scene of a lot of creative activity. There is a, there's a lot going on. There are a lot of materials that you're engaging with and it seems a, a, a number of mediums as well. I mean, looking at some of these images, one might get the impression that you're as much a painter as a sculptor. Could you talk a bit about the materials and um, kind of building strategies that make up your practice, generally speaking? Sure. Um, well, I, I do collect a lot of junk. So there's that to begin with. And um, so I like I like working with with a lot of different things happening at the same time. Um, I I feel like the sculpture tends to get made in batches, so there's like all this kind of plethora of ingredients, and then from that soup, these things tend to emerge. Um, and um, so there's usually some kind of found furniture or car parts in the studio. Um, and various stages of wood and logs being cut up. And then the painting and um, yeah, I just, I mean, I always made like small watercolor and gouache paintings and it's just, for me, it's just such a direct relationship with color, I think. So it, it often, um, um, when I'm painting a sculpture, <laughs> I'll also be making a painting on a piece of plywood at the same time and they wind up being in the same palette. Um, I like, like I said, I just, I like working back and forth uh, between a lot of sculptures and, and these um, wall works at the same time. Um, you know, sometimes things will definitely take my focus and I'll kind of zone in and, and work on one thing for you know, a day, a few days, a week, a month, but somehow for me, it's most comfortable when it's in this larger soup of material. You are working oftentimes with wood as a material, although it doesn't feature in the work that you currently have at UH, where do you typically source this material? Um, I, the, like all the wood that you see here, pretty much I get from the same place that we get our firewood and they're a local lumber yard that 
mills their own lumber and sells firewood and wood chips. And if I go out, well, before COVID, I would go out in their field and kind of, um, they just give me like a marker and I could tag stuff that wasn't good enough to be cut into boards. Um, and it's pretty reasonable. And then I would kind of just draw where I'd want them to cut it into big enough, you know, small enough chunks that I could start to work, work with it. Um, and then they load it into a dump truck and dump it in the parking lot. And then I just slowly, so like th this batch of wood, I've actually, I probably, I think I got a delivered to the studio three or three and a half years ago or four years ago maybe and I'm kind of getting to the end of it now it, wood, wood is so interesting to work with and I'm relatively new at it it just it's always changing and it takes I mean for these larger you, you, there's some of these hollow pieces here but for some some that you can't see that are that large but not hollow they, they I mean they'll take they're not gonna be fully dry for 10 years. Um, so it's really interesting to be carving and then leaving something for a year, or six months and, and it kind of cracks in certain ways. It's just, it's very much a, a working with a very alive material. Um, and I see that you, I just am noticing for the first time that you have multiple chainsaws in your arsenal. Have you become a sort of connoisseur of chainsaws through this practice of working with wood? Well, you know, um, my husband who like anything nice I have in my life, it's from him. <laughs> he got me my first, um, the McKee, I think that McKee on the table is a uh, electric. And so that was, and that's a pretty small, smallish. That was the first, I mean, we always had one at home for cutting wood outside, but this one was nice because I could use it inside without fumes. Um, and then, the other one is is pretty big saw. It, it's hard to see in the scale of the Husqvarna, and that I just got uh, probably a little over a, a year, year and a half ago, and that's been amazing. Like when I went, I was a little bit scared. The guy was talked me into buying this bigger saw, and I'm not really like I'm 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 good with tools, but I'm not like a tool person. Like I'm not a tool. Like I don't love tools or I'm not kind of that person that um, nerded out in the tool room or anything. I, I, I just like it when they work for me. <laughs> so I was a little nervous actually to get this bigger saw because it's pretty big. And he talked me into it because I had these bigger logs. I don't, you can't really see them here that I need to get through. And it was so great. Like it's such a beautiful machine and it just works so well. And I could it did the job that I needed it to do. And it didn't feel unsafe at all when I was using it. You know, I was a little nervous at first, but now it it's just such a joy um, to have a tool that can actually do the thing you need it to do. <laughs> um, and I find this, the chainsawing, the, the carving practice actually, this is gonna sound weird, but um, I find it meditative um, in the same way that I think like, I've heard people say riding a motorcycle, it's like you have to really pay attention because there is this, you're, you're kind of on the line of, you know, something that could be quite dangerous. So when I'm, when I'm working with a chainsaw and carving a piece of wood, I just feel like, like it's one of these activities where I could be doing it for three hours and it feels like 20 minutes. It's just the time you get so involved um, really in the moment, just with, I'm so involved with what I'm doing the rest of the world fades away and it um it's relaxing which again is odd because like i don't really like loud noises you know and like i said i'm not really a tool person but it just something about the the kind of this taking it's almost like hair cutting which i also like i've always liked cutting hair and i find it kind of similar <laughs> um just this ten, it's like attending to something and it takes a lot of attention and I really, I really enjoy it. It's been a nice surprise for me in the studio. That was really beautifully articulated and really makes me actually want to go out and buy it. <laughs> I recommend um, it, I recommend it. And kind of um, is an interesting segue uh, to begin considering your work that is now with us here in Houston called Here, which in prior conversations you've 
described to me almost in similar terms. Can you um, just start by telling us what we're looking at? What is this work? Um, what's it made of and, and what's its form? So this is here and it's made from um, a concrete drainage culvert um, fitted with uh, steel frames that are, that are glazed with colored glass. Um, and the concrete, uh, I work with a, with a, with a uh, concrete um, yard in Connecticut here, not too far where they do a lot of these um, drainage culverts. And this is, this is from a standard mold that they have. Um, so the cylinder itself is from a standard mold. And then I made a drawing of where I'd like them to place the holes. Um, and that's a process that they're really used to. It's not that special for them. They often get orders for pipes and then people need the holes in certain places to connect for underground sewers or wiring. Um, yeah, and then, and then I ordered um, these four different colors of um, glass um, that got fitted into frames and then we bolted those into the um, the concrete cylinder. And my, my son, my two older sons actually helped me figure out exactly how big the, the largest circle that I could get that would still fit within the ledge of the concrete because it's on a curve. Um, and I still don't know how they did it, but they both use different methods and like, I guess, is it trigonometry? I'm not sure. And came up with the same answer. So <laughs> it worked. So you can see the, the, the glass comes right to the edge. <clears throat> um, and then it kind of goes to the edge on the inside of the, um, of the ledge of that uh, concrete ledge as well. Yeah, it's one of the really captivating details of the piece that I didn't really notice until I went to go see it in person. Um, and it speaks to the, the um, I don't it creates this kind of sense of, of visual or material friction between the two components, this the concrete element and then these glass panels. Um, and you explained to me earlier that in a way it, it um, it invites us to imagine the conjunction between a cylinder and a, a cube or a kind of rectilinear shape. So if conceptually, if the panels, if the glass panels um, extended out further, they would meet at right angles. Um, so we're invited to kind of imagine this illusion of a cube um, kind of um, hugging uh, the cylinder very tightly. Yeah, that's a nice way to put it. Yes, it's. How did you uh, select these colors to work with? And maybe you can help us decipher what the colors are. Yeah, there is a slide in there where I have like a color, a bunch of color studies I did. Um, it was the slide with all the different, uh, let's see, maybe it's not in there. Anyway, I, yeah, there you go. So I, <laughs> I started out by taking um, a glass cube that I had already made and it's very rem remedial. I didn't even know if I wanted to show this cause so dorky, but so I just like cut, um, cut paper and put it on there and took it outside to try to get to see what some of these colors would look like when you're kind of going around. Um, and there, it was really just uh, an intuitive process. Like I, from here, I went and took glass that I had in the studio that matched some of these colors and just set up again, like a makeshift cube um, until I got the colors that I wanted the way they translated um, when they translated through, you know, uh, across through the other, through the other color, um, yeah, it was it was it's all it's all pretty intuitive, um, and there there are times that it's that it's more you know walking around the piece. One of the things that 
I was um, enjoying walking around the piece is that the, you know, some depend also depending on where the light comes, the color is either reflecting, you know, it's reflecting back at you, or sometimes it's much more translucent. Sometimes it takes getting up close to see the color on the other side. Um, and there, in, in situations like this, you start to see like a little bit of an infinity of the reflection. You can see a third reflection of a circle back in that second one and, you know, on and on, things like that. So it, the, the color transparency actually wound up being pretty subtle in this piece. Um, but so I just, just to clarify for viewers who maybe haven't been able to see the piece in person, there is um, there's a kind of a darker blue, a lighter blue, this more kind of rosy purple color and yellow. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Yep. And what is the nature of the glaze that that is on the glass and what sort of visual effects does it create? Um, well, the glass is um, is it's a it's a heat treated safety glass that is sandwiched with a film of um is this what you mean in a technical way like explain what the, the glass yeah is? and just so just to also to help viewers um uh capture like the experience of looking through it right because it's not um completely um well it's partially it's transparent but it's also partially reflective yeah it's i mean the, the amazing thing to me about glass is is that it 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 really does run from being almost completely transparent. I mean, the color in these uh, uh, in these lenses or windows, whatever you want to call them, is, is, is very close to being fully transparent. But as soon as they're hit by light, they become completely opaque. I mean, it, it, it's like, uh, well, it's like being in your house when you have the light on inside, people can see in. But at night, you know, if there's a light outside your house and your house is dark, the light just reflects back off um, to the outside. And the same thing happens with these and then all sorts of combinations in between. So here in this picture, the parts that I like are when you don't really know what's reflection and what's, and what's a transparency. So you can see there's some leaves in this lens that sort of seem like they're from the other side, but if you stop and think about it, they're really being reflected from behind the viewer. Um, and then you have these layers of reflection and transparency that get kind of confusing. And I really love that feeling of like not really knowing what's going on visually. I find that it's just, it's just kind of a freeing place to be <laughs> where the mind can just kind of spin a little bit. Yeah, and also the the circular form invites this ongoing process of walking around it in a kind of meditative state, and it seems simple, right? Um, but in I think the tradition of the best um, minimalist sculpture that invites a kind of phenomenological phenomenological engagement that activates our sense of physical being in the world, the the effects of the material and um, the colored glass and the way the light interacts is actually very complicated. And we have a lot of agency to peer into these portals and you, with your body, you can um, change the sort of the filter, sort of like a physical version of Photoshop or Instagram or something. Exactly. Um, so you can, with your body, you can see how the purple layers over against this color or that color if you kind of move to one one the side of one portal or another um i i know based on our prior conversations that you're really interested in this interactive yes uh, element and yet the piece is completely enclosed so we can't go inside of it um have you thought about what that might mean or how that impacts our experience of the piece yeah hopefully it's not annoying <laughs> i mean I, I think it's, it, I think it's like, um, it often, if there's a limitation, it, it kind of can guide, um, I don't know, it can guide a really specific, um, more, it can, 
it, you know, like you said, it guides this, you know, hopefully there's a, there's a physical curiosity. I like the way you described it where, you know, you, you're drawn to kind of walk around and wait a minute, what's on this side? And a lot of people I saw interacting with this when I did get to see it in Arkansas, you know, there would be a friend on the other side or, and so when there's two people, they would kind of walk around and, um, seeing the person through it and just, yeah, seeing the reflections and how the thing moves, hopefully without really even thinking about it, more it being like a physical curiosity. Um, and it, it, there's just a limit with this where you can't go in, but I, I'm hoping that it, it delivers a rich enough experience. Um, and maybe that there's this maybe that there's a sense of um, you really feel the space on the inside, maybe even more by not being able to go in. I, I, I don't know if that's true, but um, you know, there, there's a hope that the space inside becomes this kind of special zone um, that belongs to the sculpture in a way. I like that. Um, I visited it yet again today and I was, struck by um, how the portals, these glass circles actually, they do reflect you. And so in fact, you are placed inside the sculpture visually, if not actually. And the illusion is pretty convincing if you allow yourself to kind of go down that. that oh, that's cool. So I would actually argue that yes. it, <laughs> it does create the illusion that we are inside. Uh -huh. um, like projected. Or projected, absolutely. Um, I know that you sort of mentioned this already, but I wanted um, to now show the the visual of your design for these concrete, um, the concrete structure itself. Um, could you say a little bit more about um, about this process, or maybe help us read this uh, this very cool diagram that you shared? Yeah, this was just. I mean, I sent. Um the man that I had been working with down in Connecticut, I sent him a drawing um, and then they, I think they fabricated this um, and sent it back to me, you know, for their, just I, um, for their construction. And um, yeah, it's just, I was just so, I was struck by how beautiful it was this drawing that they made. And then you can see on top, they have, um, there's the, the top down view that's just the circle. You can see the little dots where they have um, to make sure that there's hooks that go in for picking the piece up to put it on a flatbed. Um, and one of the things I really love about um, working with these drainage culverts is that they, I mean, it is a huge piece. Obviously it is cumbersome to move, but it's also built to be carted across. I mean, I'm not the first person to cart this across, across the country. This is, this is a very mundane um, part of our infrastructure that we just don't really see or think about that much. But these pieces are built to be put on, a, um, put on trucks and driven all over and buried underground. And um, I love that the practicality of that. And I, I love that um, it's just totally solves one of the issues for outdoor sculpture, which um, is, an, is an issue, which is the elements. And, um, you know, it just doesn't care. You, it's meant to be buried underground. It does not care about the rain or the snow or water or anything. And it just, I love that about it. I really appreciate that. I'm so grateful that these, I find them beautiful also. Um, but they, it's just so cool that they're, um, yeah, they're so, they're so good at being outside they, and they feel elemental. They kind of feel of the earth to me, you know, like it, almost as if they're made from, from crushed stone. Um, and you've, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but in, in the past you have made works that um, have acted like platforms for activities, but how did you make the leap um, from your sort of gallery sculpture practice to working with these drain pipe like concrete structures? Yeah, well, I should have um, sent you a picture of this, but there, there, the I think maybe the missing link is um, a piece. I was asked by a friend, Matthew Day Jackson, who's another sculptor 
who's an amazing sculptor. And he asked me to make a piece for a show he was curating in Wyoming. And um, he said, I'll just, just send me the plans and I'll make, I'll make it down here. You know, I'll get, <laughs> me and my friends will make it for you. And um, at that point, I, ha I, was, I had been using the, the, you know, some of the car parts and the truck caps and building these makeshift um, structures for, but they were, as you say, they weren't really so stable for outside. They were more to be inside. Um, so I, I, I had him um, locate a shipping container, one of these galvanized steel shipping containers. And we, I designed a sculpture out of that where he would, he cut, he cut the shipping container and, um, okay, you go have dinner, have school. I'll be down in a minute. Um, and I made, again, like I, I made a drawing for him um, where the cuts would be. And then he found this um, shipping container and did the cuts and we ordered the glass and put frames in it. And that was the first outdoor piece that um, felt like it could really stand up to the um, elements and uh, ask your dad. Uh, and, but there was something about the, even the shipping container, you know, it, it was, it'll rust, it's kind of thin, it had the sharp edge. I don't know, just from there, I, you know, and I drive by this place in Connecticut, I drive by it all the way, all, all the time on the way to New York. I kind of see it out the window and eventually it just hit me like these might be a better vehicle um, for the glass, a better kind of uh, holder for this glass. Um, and, and again, it was this elemental kind of of the earth material um, that also I felt like might have more flexibility than these shipping containers. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's kind of how it, how it evolved. And I've, I've only made two, two of these pieces. So, I mean, really at the, it's, it's such an experiment. I feel like I'm very much at the beginning um, I'm working on some other proposals right now, but. Um, and we'll get to those too, but um, some of your comments about the works relationship to its environment um, relate to a question that we have. And I might actually start integrating sure. our audience comments because we've got some good ones. Um, Angela Moss uh, writes that she is a men's hair cutter and totally understands your description of working with the chainsaw. Um, so it's just really appreciating your work and your process, your artistry and process spoke to her. Thank you, Angela. Um, an anonymous attendee says that both in Arkansas and here in Houston, there's an interesting relationship between here, your piece, and the surrounding natural environment. In both locations, the glass elements reflect trees and greenery, as well as distort this natural backdrop. Can you talk a bit more about your work in relation to place and environment? Oh yeah, thank you. That's such a, um, that's a really astute comment. And I, um, yeah, it, 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 I think that the, the piece is really, I mean, I actually feel like this about domestically scaled sculpture as well. I kind of, um, I always appreciate the sculpture more if it makes it into somebody's home than when it's in the gallery. Not that the gallery isn't an environment, it is one, but it, it's generally one that gets kind of stripped down for, from everything except for the art that's in there. And I, I always love seeing photographs of sculpture that's in somebody's home, you know, and is, got the light reflecting off it and the furniture and the cat and all that. Um, I feel like that that's the moment when these things really come to life and are activated by the environment and kind of have more of a purpose um, as something that can project the life around them back, back out. And I would say the same thing for these larger sculptures that wind up outside. I mean, just the moving light, um, the you know, the the sun rotating up in the sky overhead, like that's such a profound um, change happens throughout the day with these pieces. And um, this is on a cloudy day, but 
there was a couple pictures um, that we went through before where you could see not only is the you know the light bouncing around inside there's patches of light that fall onto the grass so you can actually stand in the color um, in some of these moments during the day when the sun is either it's usually generally in the you know closer to the morning or the afternoon you can see the per the purple here is projected so somebody can actually stand in that pool of light which I really like that idea of um, yeah just this you know to to reflect the environment I um, it's a tall order I think to you know put a sculpture outside in this kind of um, you know amazing like in in Arkansas it's basically like a botanical garden that th this this show is in and um, I, I guess I feel I feel in awe of the environment and um, it feels like a gift that I, I guess I want to set the sculpture up in a way that it can project that back and and integrate into that and um, pay homage to that you know at the same time um, at the same time there's a bluntness to the concrete which is almost the opposite which I like too it's kind of it's kind of like in some ways it's kind of a stupid looking sculpture you know it <laughs> I will respectfully disagree, but yes. okay. well, maybe that's the wrong word. But the there's a bluntness to the form, and there's kind you know the 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 concrete is so absorb. It's exactly the opposite of the glass. It just absorbs everything, um, and it's a it's a pretty simple form. So there there's that combined with the glass, which is exactly the opposite. It's so complicated. It's never you know the the concrete kind of stays the same, and the glass just goes crazy. <laughs> Um, I, I wanted to kind of go back to this, your um, um, pointed observation about how the, the colored light projects out into our space. And I just, I had, I had forgotten or maybe um, not noticed that. And it's another way in which the work um, is kind of reaching out to us. Um, and so this, um, this uh, inert material of the concrete is actually um, deceptive because of how much the work actually, it is very porous. We are reflected into the piece and the piece also projects its light out towards us, which is so beautiful. Um, um, I'd like to share a question from your fellow exhibiting artist in Colorfield, Amos Cochran, um, who wonders, did you ever consider leaving one of the circles open for people to climb in? I did, I, I absolutely did. And um, with this particular piece, it was an issue. It was a, um, what do you call it? Like an insurance issue. We couldn't, I know I'd, it may have been the same if it came to you all in Houston, but certainly I know they, they were just, we couldn't have that <laughs> just for liability reasons. I think that the, the museum couldn't have something um, that you could need it to climb in and out of. And it's also an ex ex, uh, accessibility issue, which I appreciate. So if there were someone to come and view this and there, there have, when people come and view this in a wheelchair at this point, they have the same viewing experience as somebody who's walking around. And if we opened up one of the portholes, then um, that, would be, that would be inaccessible to them. So those so were this the- ladder here is just kind of- I know, this was- <laughs> It was really fun installing it and being in there. Um, and then, and then of course, like, how do you get out? <laughs> <laughs> um, slightly earlier, you also, um, as you were speaking about the effects of light, um, your, co your commentary was kind of touching on this transcendent quality that the work has. And, um, and so I want to just take that opportunity to transition into some of um, your influences for the piece, you had shared with me these really remarkable images of stained glass. Can you talk a little bit about um, some of your inspiration um, looking back into art history for this work? Sure. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, there's so much amazing um, stained glass, especially it, you know, especially in our architecture that tends towards the religious. Um, 
but certainly across all cultures. Um, and there's this, this, I especially love this, this mosque with the tile floor where the light comes down and you almost feel it's liquid. It's reflecting off this um, shiny floor and just the feeling um, of this colored light as a physical presence um, and some kind of reflection or metaphor for, I don't know, for a higher, I guess, just a higher, higher, uh, not higher, but just a different, um, for an inspiration, I guess, for an inspiration of, of you know, and that speaks to spirit, um, you know, something that can't really, doesn't really have a physical form, uh, which is so, to me, it's just still so like, it's such a, it's such a crazy phenomenon, like that this color reflected on the floor can be so vibrant and so, um, what's the word, you know, it, it, it brings up uh, so much in, in feeling and sense, and yet there's nothing physically there, um, which is amazing. And to me, it just, it, it does kind of speak to this, like, what else, you know, there's all this stuff that's not physically there in the world that we, we still can kind of feel or sense at a certain point. And, um, and I'm also, I don't think I sent you a picture, but I'm also just so taken with like the light in paint, landscape painting and um, in particular the, the luminous and um, the landscape painters that really um, turn their attention towards the light hitting the earth and that, that uh, you know, that interaction between the light basically hitting nature, um, which this is kind of like too, and just this feeling of like larger than, you know, larger than us and the mystery of the natural world and beyond. Um, you had also shared with me uh, these images of Ellsworth Kelly's chapel in Austin. Was this something you were thinking directly about in preparing here? I, I mean, sure. I, I, this is such a beautiful piece. I've never been, I gotta go. Um, but yeah, I, I loved, I especially loved this photo on the, on the right with this woman actually standing in the pool of light. Again, it's just this, it's such a physical, like there's nothing physically hitting her, I guess, but it's such a, you can really feel the light on her body. And so, it's just kind of a, um, it's, it's very mysterious to me. You know, the whole thing is just like, what, what's happening there? And that it can be so evocative. Um, but yeah, this is a, this is an amazing piece of architecture. I, I hope I get to see it someday. Have you seen it? I know it just opened. I have not. I shouldn't not submit that to public public. on a recording, but no, I haven't made the pilgrimage yet. Um, I, I, I am so grateful um, for your sharing of your process and, and it's really helping, you know, those of us in the audience really understand how um, an artist's practice is a kind of ongoing experimentation. And here, the piece that we have here at U, U of H, as you said, is the second of a kind of new body of work that you've developed that you know very much connects to what you were doing before, but is breaking new ground in terms of its scale, in terms of its materiality, and it's um, you know helping you pursue interests you've had for a long time, but um, in a slightly different way. Um, some of other artists who I was reminded of when I encountered your piece um, were the the Sun Tunnels of the great land artist Nancy Holt, which do take this kind of cylindrical form, do recall this form of the drainage pipe. But I think um, the point of comparison that I find most interesting is the way in which this work, as does yours, creates a kind of platform for where things can happen. It creates a place out of, uh, out of almost like a, a place that wasn't a place before or a non-place. I mean, at least in terms of the campus at U of H, where your work is situated now, 
before your work was placed there, it was a it was a, a patch of of landscaped grass that I never would have noticed or paid attention to, but your work being put there, all of a sudden it creates a center, um, which I just think is is really, um, I mean, gets this kind of like magical power of what really powerful works of art can accomplish. Mm. This is a beautiful, yeah, such a beautiful piece. And I've definitely thought about this piece in, you know, particular, I mean, I've always loved her work, but certainly now um, it feels like I'm a direct, in direct lineage. Um, yeah, so it's so, it's so beautiful. I, I've never been here either, so I, ha I hope to. Um... And the other artist that your um, work, particularly in glass, reminded me of was Dan Graham and his practice of making these pavilions that um, are multi-layered and he's also played with um, different glass films that create um, different levels of, you know, opacity, transparency, reflection um, that encourage a kind of uh, physical interaction um, and and illusion, kind of participatory illusions. Yeah, I I mean I def again like I I feel um, super inspired by. Dan Graham's work. I think it's, I mean, it, all the pieces that I've seen in person um, just have been such a, a powerful like body, mind and spirit experience. And it's not just visual and it's not just physical, but it's where these two things um, kind of come together. And there's so much subtlety in the work um, with the reflections and it really feels like it's like, again, so much about um, setting up this situation where people can get really, really involved and lost in looking um, and the experience of, of looking and, yeah. And, and yet your contribution here, which we don't see in this earlier work is this incredible um, saturation of color um, we did have another question in the in the Q and A um, about your choices of color. Someone wants to know whether you had considered um, using complementary colors rather than um, you. And here you have three colors from the same color family: purples and blues, and then the addition of this yellow. Yeah, I you know I again it's one of these I don't know. I, I'm, I just am drawn more to tertiary. It's just where, where I go, where I, more where, where I wind up and I don't, there's no good reason for that um, at all, except there's no kind of intellectual argument or reason. It's just, I mean, I, I definitely tend towards the sun, sunset colors. And I feel like in some ways, maybe I'm always just trying to like live, live in a sunset, which is pretty corny and embarrassing, but might be true. And um, yeah, the, the color choice, it's funny. Like I remember thinking like I, I wound up with those three in that similar color field. I didn't want it to be too Skittlesy, if that makes any sense. Like it was a, it was, it felt like a balance of wanting there to be different colors that could interact and, and make a third color. So this simple equation of what two colors when we're looking across can interact to make a third color without being, I don't know. Um, it's very, intu very intuitive and I, it's, um, yeah, it's, there's, there's no theory there. <laughs> There's They're more, beautiful. More, mostly just feeling. You can't really argue it's, with that. It's really for feeling. So this is the point where I wanted to look back at um, some other earlier pieces, just so we have a better sense of you know what was happening in your work before here. Um, these are a couple works that um, represent um, more of your kind of gallery sculpture. Um, the gallery sculpture corner of your oeuvre where you're um, combining 
found objects, a lot of wooden furniture with these um, chunks of wood that you explained to us that you meditatively chainsaw into pieces and then also conjoined with glass elements as well. Can you talk a little bit about the process of, of how do you fit together these puzzle parts and how they, how, where do you start in works like these? Yeah, I mean, it does kind of start, start in a jumble really. Um, and I, it's a process of um, rotating pieces, um, you know, clamping pieces together, unclamping, moving around, cutting a hole. It's, it's, it's pretty, um, it's pretty fluid like that. It, um, if you can imagine the studio from the pictures before, there's kind of just this constant movement of pieces in and out of relationship to each other until it just feels right, um, until they kind of click. And, um, the, you know, there are times like, for instance, with this piece, which is an older piece, um, there are times when I'm moving stuff around and then I get an, I get an idea and then at a certain point I have to make a plan. Um, so in this case, I had to, I worked with a guy who, who, who welded these um, steel frames and then um, I ordered it. This is with plexiglass um, before I started using glass. So this was, so it's, there, there, there is a point at, at some of the sculptures, especially, um, when I'm ordering glass or if I'm making a larger work where I need, you know, I need to make the thing be able to stand up, right? I, I do have to make drawings and plan things out, but, um, but there's a lot of kind of just everything moving around trying to find its place before that, before that moment. And some of these works that we're now looking at um, point in the direction of here and um, another work of yours that is uh, its companion, I would argue, Day Trip, that was exhibited at Art Omi, um, that act as kind of pavilions for things to happen, including uh, musical performances. Can you talk about, you know, how did you make this transition from these self-contained sculptures with architectural elements, elements that's, that sort of imply but do not literally invite the engagement of a human body um, to works that actually do in fact invite our participation. Yeah, it's funny you ask that because the truth when I think back like for this particular sculpture and there was a few sculptures in this, this one show that I did at Mitchell Innes that were the first, and this was one of them, the first sculptures that you could go inside. And I remember in this piece, um, you know, I had, I kind of had the, the truck cap was like up on some stilts. I had it propped up and I was kind of building this glass thing. I had, I had a big cardboard box that I was kind of mapping out what that shape would be. And, um, and then I had just, I had like some cushions in there and my son was in this, coming to the studio with me and I'm basically just like throw <laughs> some books in there and he would be in there when I was working. And, and then I would go in and at that point, I, I really didn't think that people would be going inside it. I, I just thought I was making a sculpture. Um, and then the more I started hanging out in there, it just happened. And I kind of remember thinking like, this is, this is stupid. You can't have a sculpture that people go inside. It's too gimmicky. You know, this is my mind. Like this is like the, the critical mind, you know, which is always, you know, telling me what, what I can't do and what, what's going to be dumb and all that stuff. And then the sculpture just kept saying, yeah, this is who I am. I, I, I'm a, I'm a sculpture that people are going to go inside. And my mind was going like, that's stupid. And then the sculpture won the fight, which is great. Like that's the best case scenario. And what I always want is for the sculpture to lead the way and for my critical intellectual mind to be put down where it belongs, you know, back in a box or for, you know, for whatever, doing math or something, but not for deciding what kind of art should be made. Um, and it opened the way for 
works like yeah. a trip. Um, Absolutely. It, has yeah. a reading nook. it is a reading nook and it, and it has a lot of, yeah. um, what books did it have? Um, I tried to have, I, we have a local at the dump, at least before COVID, there's a, like a take it or leave it book section, which is just amazing. Um, it's such a beautiful place. And I just mostly got all the books there and it was, it's just a range. I tried to just have a real range of, it, it tended to be a lot of nature books. Um, but I wanted to have kids books in there. It didn't really have like a focus. It was more wanting to have a real range of things that basically books like that, I just really would want to look at. Um, and I, I, I don't know if I should say this, but I, I also tried not to like steer away from books that I guess I'm leery of like art that would make people feel like they were stupid or something. Like I really just wanted this to be enjoyable. So I didn't put books in there that I thought were like too smarty pants or something. I don't know. It was just like, and, and a lot of picture books. There were, there were some novels and other things, but mostly um, science and nature and stuff like that, um, gardening. And here people could actually recline in one of the portals. Yeah, I didn't, that was so sweet. I didn't, certainly didn't plan for that. And it was such a, it was so, again, with both of the pieces, you know, with the first piece, um, the one that was in the gallery, I was just so struck by that people took the invitation, they, like they were really hungry for it. And they would go in and spend time in there and love it. And I, I just, it really, I don't know, it made me so happy and just made me really mindful of that, like going forward of just creating something where people could really slow down and take a minute and step out of their own life and into this other thing and maybe get like this pause. Um, well, I had, that was really beautiful and actually to my mind speaks to the, you know, best qualities of of public art really, um, that it's for the public, but that also it's, you know, welcoming of the public. And I think your work is doing all of these things very successfully. I have two more questions for you. I do want to um, invite the public to enter your questions in the chat so that I can leave those in in our last minutes um, because we do need to wrap up. Um, but with our students in mind, um, I, I promise to ask these two questions. The first question is, What's next? What are you working on now? And the other question is, um, what is your advice for young artists? Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, so what's next? I think I was gonna actually send you pictures and I forgot. I, I'm working on, a, on, on some plans for more concrete. This is a, well, this is a proposal for um, um, a transformation of this metal shack that somebody has in their their yard that's also going to be part, slightly public um, because they work with a lot of kids, do kids programming. Um, and this was another reading room idea. Um, but I'm, I'm also working on some uh, plans for concrete and glass sculptures. Um, and I, you know, I wanted to just say also before I forget that I loved how you were talking about, you know, there's these two pieces, it's really an experiment. And I owe a lot to Allison Glenn, who curated this show um, for, it was kind of a last minute decision to allow me to make a new, they were gonna take an older sculpture for the piece and it wound up having some issues that we couldn't, we couldn't lend it. Um, and she gave me the green light to make this sculpture here, which was a, you know, would be a new sculpture. And it really, you know, I, it's just, it's such a gift to an artist. To, it was such a gift to me to have this opportunity to, you know, otherwise I'm not gonna be making this kind of thing. It's, it's, it's too big an investment and to, to be too crazy for me to make. And so, um, I just wanted to say that and to have it be part of this show that then got to travel, which is so amazing. Um, so I think, um, you know, for probably for all the artists in the show, it's similar, like these, these, these shows of outdoor works, they're, you know, I'm hoping that 
they're wonderful for everyone there, but they're also really wonderful for the artists involved. It's such a wonderful opportunity for all of us. It's and for outdoor sculpture, there aren't that many opportunities. So I just wanted to, to kind of double down on that and acknowledge my appreciation um, for the opportunity. And um, so, yeah, I'm really into this, making more outdoor work right now. I, I um, um, yeah, stay tuned. I don't know, I'll send you stuff if it comes to be. Well, the outdoor pieces are good pandemic art. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it is true. And, um, and then to your, to your second question of advice for, for artists, um, gosh, um, go deep, go as deep as you can, you know, just hold your nose, jump in the water and just start swimming down, 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 down as far as you can. And the cool thing about being in art school is like, you'll be down underwater and then you'll see your friend underwater over there, like making a pile of shells or something. And you can kind of wave at each other and you're down there together in this, you know, weird, nonverbal way of communicating with each other. And it's so beautiful. It, I, I just think that art school is such a, um, it's such a, it's such a gift and such a unique way to be, a, be in communication with, with other people. And um, I would just, I guess my advice is just like really enjoy that, really enjoy um, the kind of special communication and relationship that you can get with, with, the, with your fellows at this moment um, for people in school, for sure. Um, Cause it doesn't last forever. And um, yeah, it, it, I don't know, art, and you also don't have to be professional artists. Like you can make art for your whole life and have a job and have a family or do anything else that you need to do. It doesn't need to be a career. Art making, you know, it's like playing piano. You don't need to be a concert pianist to enjoy playing piano and have it enrich your life. It's like, it's such a, it's just, I think it's just a beautiful, another w beautiful way to communicate with the world. And um, yeah, enjoy, enjoy the hell, hell out of it. It's, uh, it's a special, it's a special realm to be in, I think. Thank you, that was really beautiful. It makes me want to go back to school and get a <laughs> <It's> fun, <right? laughs> Why not? Um, we have a question from Hunter Spencer. How would you envision an audio component or musical interpretation of the piece? Oh, well, that's a good question. And we kind of didn't talk about the, the um, music because uh, we have, I have invited um, friends to play in the sculpture. So there was definitely audio <laughs> and we've uh, had a number of occasions where just invited um, friends to come play in the in the pieces, um, and then also just like for people to show up more jam band style and audio. You know, it's funny. I I my husband and I were talking the other day about um, or not the other day, but we, it, recently about um, collaborating with a with a, an artist. You know, more more to the point of the question for kind of a soundtrack um, that might that might be part of a piece. And I'm, I'm really interested in that. I, I don't know what it would entail exactly, but I, I'm super curious about it. Um, I think it's a great question and, and one that I wanna poke around in for sure. I'm interested in whoever asked the question, what they think. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, uh, yeah, maybe a future collaborator. <laughs> Well, I want to say thank you so much, Sarah. It's been so inspiring to talk to you and it makes me want to go back and spend even more time with here. Um, it will be on view at U of H through May. So please everyone come see it, come spend more time with it. Thank you for your questions. And um, I do invite you to stay on the call uh, to fill out a brief uh, poll or survey about your experience with this 
event. Thank you to the public art art um, of the University of Houston system for hosting both of us and everyone have a great evening. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody for being here. This is really fun. Thank you, Sarah. Bye.